They say it's a reworking, not an overhaul. But is there a need for Britain to change its counter-terrorism approach? Are civil liberties in danger? And where will this take Britain and its people? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Garta. Britain says it faces an ever-changing threat of terrorist attacks. The country's government is also claiming that the risk of chemical and even nuclear attacks is increasing. This week, they launched a counter-terrorism strategy that supposedly targets the causes as well as the symptoms of terror activity. But it has already raised concerns from some groups who say it could marginalize parts of UK society. Beth Ann Howe has more. July 7, 2005, a day the British government is desperate to prevent happening again. 52 people died in the bombings in London. Since then, several other similar attempts have come to light. This week, the UK's Home Office revealed its latest strategy against terrorism on its soil. Terrorists will try to stay one step ahead of us, but we've made sure that we've invested the resources, built the people, both in the police and in the agencies, and built the wider partnership necessary to give us the best chance of being able to deal with that threat. The strategy, called Contest, puts emphasis on the possibility of chemical and biological attacks. The plan suggests heightening public awareness, including training 60,000 shop workers and hotel staff to spot danger signs and how to respond in an attack situation. The report identifies Al-Qaeda and other extreme groups as still being a major threat. But it does go on to say that the threat from small groups and individuals aligning themselves with extreme ideologies could be as dangerous. To combat this, the plan suggests giving support to moderate Muslim voices in Britain and to target radicalisation by working with and in Muslim communities. And the fundamental dividing line that we're trying to establish is the vast majority of people on one side, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, who may have all sorts of different views, may criticise the government, but nevertheless are opposed to acts of terror. And on the other side of that line, that very, very small minority who advocate violent acts of terrorism. And it's that very, very small minority that we're concerned about. But some Muslims are concerned that this updated version of a 2003 document could leave some people feeling marginalised. They're concerned it could foster mistrust and damage relations within the very communities the government wants to engage with. What my concern would be is that the, this new wave of measures foster a, a suspicious environment where communities, instead of coming together in trust, are going to become more divided, where people are a bit expected to start spying on their neighbours potentially and retailers are to start spying on their customers. The latest document is the British government's most detailed strategy on counter-terrorism to date. While it identifies foreign policy as a possible catalyst for terror activity, it has some suggesting that it does not address this aspect fully and, in the current climate, that the policy should look at more than just domestic concerns. Beth Ann Howe, Inside Story. And joining us are our guests in London, Daoud Abdullah, Deputy Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain. Also in London, Tobias Feakin, Head of Homeland Security Capabilities at the Royal United Services Institute for Defence and Security Studies, or RUSI. And in Beirut, Alistair Crook, founder of the Conflicts Forum and former Special Middle East Advisor to the EU. Gentlemen, thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. Mr. Feekin, the report says that contemporary terrorist organizations might use chemical, biological, radiological, and even nuclear weapons. Uh, extraordinary claims from the report. It's scaremongering, isn't it? I think it, it represents a, a worst-case scenario as far as government thinking. Um, uh, this is based on um, evidence that, that uh, nuclear or radiological materials have perhaps been filtering through illegal transfer systems in the international system and that potentially um, Al-Qaeda operatives have been trying to um, incorporate uh, or, or recruit uh, nuclear scientists from Pakistan and also Iran. So, I mean, it, it's based on, on, on background evidence, but I think from a government perspective, it, it's because it represents that worst-case scenario. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about, uh, as they term, a CBRN 
or E attack, which is chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear, um, then essentially those kind of attacks, it's, even if they don't succeed, if some kind of material uh, which belongs to that grouping is used, then um, it, it creates an enormous fallout, both in terms of the psychological impact that that causes and also in terms of the decontamination process that has to be gone through. It creates you know, an enormous amount more disruption than perhaps more conventional devices. Dawood Abdullah, this contest too, as, uh, as the government calls it is, it, a, is it a good idea? Is this a, a viable plan? from the government? Well, I think in principle, there is always a need to review uh, uh, current uh, uh, policies and strategies and try to uh, improve them, uh, look at weaknesses uh, and address them. Uh, however, uh, some of the uh, experts in this field, uh, persons who have been uh, well experienced, uh, like the former head of head of the MI5 most recently said that um, a lot of this is scaremongering. So uh, we have to take uh, views like these on board also, as well as acknowledge the need uh, to preserve uh, uh, and maintain uh, security in the country. Mr. Abdullah, you and the Muslim Council of Britain are part of the problem, uh, says the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, because she says you called for attacks on British troops if they patrol Gaza's sea space. Yes, this is her interpretation of a document which I signed in Gaza. Unfortunately, this conclusion was based on, on, on speculation. The document, uh, which you can download from the internet, made no specific reference uh, to British troops. And it, it is quite outrageous that a, a minister of government can come to such a conclusion and take such hasty actions based on hypothetical scenarios. Uh, let me say this, that the, the, the idea of deploying British troops into the Gaza Strip uh, to support and uh, assist an illegal occupation uh, will uh, arguably be deemed a form of aggression. Uh, our prime minister had previously said when he came to office that if he were to deploy British troops in any field, any theater of such confrontations in, in, in future, the matter will be discussed in Parliament. As far as I know, this has not been discussed in Parliament. No troops were deployed uh, uh, into the region. And so we are, all, we are still in the, in the realm of speculation. Okay. So for a minister of government to take such a stand uh, is really, really inexplicable. Uh, Alistair Crook, a uh, two-pronged question. First of all, what do you make of this report? And secondly, the marginalization and, and banning of, of uh, mu the Muslim Council of, of Britain, uh, seemingly mainstream groups uh, that Dawood Abdullah belongs to. Is that the right sort of decision from the government? Well, I think this template uh, of trying to support moderates and at the same time Ex uh, uh, exclude and uh, isolate extremists, which has been the template for the Middle East, has proved to be very flawed in the Middle East. It has actually achieved the opposite. It has hollowed out, if you like, mainstream movements uh, and empowered extremists. And I think it'll be just as flawed in the UK. Of course it's um, scaremongering to use worst case scenarios in a document that is circulated very widely amongst the public. If everyone used the worst case scenarios and talking about nuclear threats, chemical weapon threats, of course ordinary, ordinary inhabitants of Britain are worried by this. They read this and they say, well, are we really at risk from it? If the government says we are, it really must be a threat. Well, but Mr. That may not be Mr. Feekin says that Mr. Feekin says that there, there is evidence to fuel these fears, Mr. Crook. Well, I mean, we don't know what the evidence is, but there's always speculation and there's always possibilities. There may be some people thinking of these things. But whether this is a realistic assessment is quite a different thing. You know, we've seen this in the Iraq war. We had uh, suggestions that missiles could fall on the UK within 45 minutes of launch from Iraq. That was a worst case assessment. It was sufficient to persuade Parliament uh, that there was a cause for war. So worst case assessments are really very dangerous things indeed. Worst case assessments are dangerous things indeed. Tobias Fekin, your response? Um, I, I, I mean, 
I wasn't suggest I'm not suggesting, and I'm not sitting here as a government representative, so I'd rather not be treated as such. But um, I, in terms of uh, the government discussing those kinds of threats, I mean, you know, from their perspective, they've got to consider these things. Absolutely. I mean, that the public don't want to be scared to the point of not wanting to come out of their homes. And I, I would never suggest for an instant that, you know, this is this is something that's imminently going to happen. Um, but, you know, something that, that has to be considered. I mean, I think something that, that, that is important out of this document that perhaps, you know, individuals in the in anywhere in the UK should should consider is just about being, you know, more more um, uh, observant, perhaps. And it was interesting in your opening remarks, there were talks about spying on each other, uh, sp people spying on each other within within communities. I don't think it's really so much that kind of uh, action that, that that I would interpret this as. I think I think really it's is it's looking for, for people just to be a bit more observant about their, their surroundings and if they if they perceive but, anything that's but you do really understand unusual that, going on around them, then feel, they should report that. Mr Vegan, people feel that this uh, this might uh, be some sort of Orwellian reality and that the country is going on a slippery slope towards becoming a, a police state. Those are your words and not mine, I wouldn't agree. Let's bring in Dawood Abdullah. Dawood Abdullah you deal with the Muslim community, particularly the Muslim youth. 7-7, um, seven, seven, the attacks happened in 2005. Since then, do Muslims feel more included in British society or not? I think there are still uh, very uh, uh, major challenges facing the Muslim community uh, in a number of areas, in employment, in housing, in education, in health. Uh, and, and, and because Muslims are very much at the bottom of the league in all of these areas, uh, there is a, a, a sense of, of uh, uh, dissatisfaction uh, with their, their condition. It has to be addressed. And when we have, you see, a, a, a government focusing on, on issues that are hypothetical, that do not really address the bread and butter issues, uh, this really uh, uh, reflects a, a, a failure. Uh, on the part of, of, of those who are supposed to address the needs but, of, of, but of these Abdullah, Muslims. But Mr. Abdullah, has the Muslim community truly looked itself in the mirror and accepted the reality that it was homegrown British Muslims that carried out uh, the attacks on uh, July the 7th? Uh, are you suggesting that Britain's 2.5 million Muslims were responsible for those acts on, on July the 7th? Certainly not. I hope not. Uh, this can happen in any society. Uh, but uh, uh, we should not, you know, hold an entire community responsible uh, for this. We have been down this path before in, uh, during the Troubles in Ireland. And, and many pe people were, were incarcerated and, and, and detained uh, uh, for long periods of time. We should learn from that experience and not, you know, uh, uh, hold the entire Muslim community uh, hostage uh, because of, of the acts of, of, of some who, you know, ha have resorted to such measures. Uh, people are trying to engage the, the, the extending the hands of cooperation, but at the same time, uh, they find that the, the relationship is an imbalanced one. The relationship is one of uh, uh, a, a condescension, where people think it is a favor to engage with you. Okay. If you, if you are given money from the government, this is a favor. It should be the opposite. The government is obliged to give money to community organizations. Okay. Okay. They pay into the pu public coffers. All right, it is time for a short break, but when we come back, we look deeper into whether the report really tackles the root causes of the problem. Stay with us.